Dr. Karen Meech is on the faculty at the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy since 1987. She is a past TED Talk presenter, where she talked about the historic discovery of the first interstellar object, or ISO, which passed through our solar system in 2017 and was given the Hawaiian name Oumuamua. A second ISO was discovered less than two years later. These two ISOs have provoked intense and sustained interest as these objects provide clues to the planet formation process outside our solar system. Because these ISOs enable the close-up study of material from other planetary systems, the discoveries have energized a new interdisciplinary awareness and require incorporation of a diverse range of scientific disciplines in the study of planet formation. In this EH meeting, Karen shared how these objects were discovered and characterized. She highlighted some of the remaining mysteries and controversies and what we can do in the future with regard to space missions for the exploration of future interstellar objects. Well, in the meeting, my name is Kanan Sean. I'm the I'm with Hawaii Geophysical Services. I'm the president of uh, EAH. I do have an announcement. Next week, Saturday, all the board members who are joining us, uh, we are doing our, we're going to do a strategic planning meeting for the direction and the future of this um, organization. It's going to be at Hawkeye Country Club. It's at noon. And please, please, please RSVP me as soon as you can. I am going to introduce Karen Leach, who is with the UH Astronomy College. She has been there since 1987 after finishing her graduate studies in MIT. And she, her undergraduate was in Rice. She studied planetary physics in graduate school. She has came here once before and spoke to us about how we got all of our water. With that, I am going to turn it over to Karen. Thanks for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk to you about visitors from outside the solar system. And this is mostly a science talk. I'll do get into some ethics issues uh, with regard to what some scientists are doing that are going on the UFO side. Well, let me start with the science. And so when I'm talking to visitors, we're talking about some material that entered our solar system that came from another star system. And so I'm going to be talking about the PanSTARS telescope up here. Um, the PanSTARS telescope is shown in the lower left. This is a big facility on Haleakala, Maui, which is designed to survey the sky every night. There's two telescopes, and they're surveying the sky to look for near-Earth objects, things that approach the Earth that could be hazardous. And so NASA is funding a big survey for this. In um, 2019, or 2017, Rob Warrick, who's shown at the upper uh, left of the slide, he was looking at the data that came in overnight. It automatically flags things that are moving, but you usually have to have a human to make sure it's not an artifact. You can see the actual image of the detector in the lower right. It's a huge array of imagers, and there's a lot of defects on it. So he, in fact, looked at it and said, yes, indeed, there's an actual object that's shown in the red circle under the discovery image. You probably can't see it with the lighting here, but it's a very faint streak. So it means it's something close to the Earth that's moving really fast, and they see these every night. He looked at the data from the previous night and also saw this image and said, okay, it's a real object. And so then they started to get more data with a couple more telescopes. And so in the subsequent couple of nights, they followed it up, got an orbit and said, this is likely coming from outside the solar system. And at this part point, the head of the survey, Richard Wainscote, he's shown in the right-hand picture, uh, the foreground uh, fellow, he called me at home on a Sunday. I'd just gotten back from a big science meeting and it'd been my first day off in months. And I, he goes, I think we found an interstellar object. My first thought was, did it really have to be today? Because I just wanted to relax. And then I got excited because I knew what this was gonna mean. So I said, all right, we will start writing proposals and get telescope time. Um, and in the meantime, Finally, the orbit was published in the area that all astronomers can see a couple days later. So, what was this thing? Well, let's first take a look at where it came from. So this is a diagram showing our solar system, and you can see the plane of all the planets here. The dotted line shows the path of this thing. 
So this object came from above the plane of the solar system, passed beneath the plane of all the planets, but very close to the sun, inside the orbit of Mercury, and then as it was moving out again, it passed by the Earth. And it actually got very close to the Earth, about 63 Earth-Moon distances. And so we didn't discover it till afterwards. And you can see in the inset, the position where it's labeled U1, that's where it was when it was discovered. You know, people say, well, couldn't you have seen it sooner? Well, to see it sooner, you would have had to have been uh, looking towards the sun. And none of the surveys will ever be looking towards the sun for obvious reasons. So this was about as early as we could have ever seen it. And you know, people ask, where is it now? It's still in the solar system. But in fact, um, all these dates up here just show where it was at certain times. A uh, year ago, June, it was just past the orbit of Neptune. And it'll be just past the orbit of Pluto in February of next year. So it's got a long ways before it leaves our solar system, but it's moving fast. Well, the initial name that we gave it was just the catalog number from the survey, and that's hard to type. And I was typing a lot of emails. So we asked some local Hawaiian experts to propose a name. We said it's a first of its kind. It's discovered in Hawaii. Let's have a Hawaiian name. So on Friday of that week, we asked them, please propose a name. And by Sunday, they came back with a name. So Larry Kimura from um, UH and Kiao Kimura, who's a Polynesian navigator and the director of the Imaloa Center, proposed Oumuamua, a scout or messenger from the distant past reaching out to us. And we thought that was a very nice name, although a lot of people at first had trouble pronouncing it. So let's explore what we want to know and how we figured it out. It's the first of its kind. So you want to know the basics. How big is it? What is it made of? Um, is it rotating? What's its size? All these sorts of things. You also want to know what's the chemistry? What does the surface look like? Maybe some detailed chemistry. And then a big burning question is, where does this thing come from? Well, there was a problem with all of this. And the graph in the upper left is showing the brightness as a function of time. So the blue curve is an astronomer's brightness scale, a magnitude scale. And for every difference of five magnitudes, that's a hundred, a factor of 100 in brightness. So at the discovery, those two red arrows to the left, discovery in the previous night, it was at its brightest. By the time we realized what it was, the third arrow over, it's already faded a lot. And the part where it's easy to observe is just that yellowish, vertical box. So about a week is the time when it's easy. And it's because it's moving away so fast from us. Um, so we have some challenges. You can also see some other arrows where I've listed Hubble Space Telescope observations, the three black ones, and then Spitzer. You might wonder, well, why would you wait so long? Well, Hubble, you can't just suddenly say tonight, oh, fabulous discovery, we want it tonight. They upload a schedule in three week chunks. And if you interrupt that schedule, a lot of people lose their time. So you don't do that unless it's urgent. And Spitzer, an infrared telescope in space, can't point very close to the sun. So that was as early as it could go. So just to remind you, here's the calendar. It was discovered on a Thursday. By Sunday, I knew what it was. We had one week, and all of those are listing writing proposals for the world's biggest telescopes, getting it approved within a day, um, getting it on the telescope, getting the observations. So I moved into the office, I'm sleeping in the office, people are observing, they're looking at the data, they're reducing it, and we're writing the paper. By Sunday, at the end of the week, they delivered us the Hawaiian name and we submitted the paper to Nature uh, on Monday. So within a week, we got all the data we are ever gonna get and we submit the paper. And then the referees turned it around very quickly. And we also submitted on the 30th, we submitted the name of the object to the International Astronomical Union. You can't just name things because you feel like it. There's a body that has to approve it. it usually takes a year. They turned it around in a week. So that was phenomenal. Um, so that was the excitement with this. We pretty much used all of the world's biggest telescopes. There were a lot of observers collaborating. I even called complete strangers and said, 
here's what we've got. I see you have telescope time. Would you like to give some to us? Um, and they would say, yes. Of course, they became co-authors on the paper, so we weren't just stealing telescope time. So we used a lot of telescopes. So let's take a look at what we learned about this thing and how we did it. The basic, simplest thing you can measure is the brightness of something. And what will that get you? Well, brightness depends on the size of the thing, what it's made of, and how big it is. And unlike this little firefly creature here, these things don't glow by themselves. It's reflected sunlight. And that's why it really depends on the distance. As you can see in the image of fireflies, if you didn't know what those were and didn't have any context, you don't know if it's something nearby that's faint or something far away that's really bright. So in fact, we can't tell if it's dark and big or bright and small. However, comets are particularly dark, so we made an assumption. Maybe it's just like a comet and it's dark. Comets actually reflect only about 4% of the light, so they're darker than this table here. So assuming that it's really dark, it turns out that it was only about 100 meters in um, radius. So it wasn't very big, you know, football field size like. All right, we've got a basic size, but we're assuming it's reflectivity. It could be smaller if it's more reflective. Is it a comet or an asteroid? Asteroids are rocky bodies in the solar system. And we think this is a chunk like a comet or asteroid from elsewhere. Or is it a comet? Comets have these big, beautiful tails. <clears throat> So we looked in detail. What we're seeing in the various rows are different dates when we observed with different telescopes. And we added all of the data together for the whole night. And what you see in the second column are just dots, just a point of light, no tail, no tail evident at all. The bottom row is actually a model of a tail. We've got the lower left, um, Bottom left, you can see a really nice tail. That was a simulation if we had thrown 200 kilograms of dust into space. That's what it would look like. The second one on the bottom, you can barely see any dust. And that one is if we threw two kilograms, like a five pound bag of flour into space. And the three columns represent filtering techniques. And so for the model, you can clearly see that we've got evidence of dust. Same filtering techniques are shown above on the actual points of light, absolutely nothing. So we come to the conclusion, this is an asteroid, there's no dust at all. Tiny amount of dust could be hiding there and we wouldn't see it, but there's really no dust. All right, so we've got, um, it's an asteroid, we know approximately how big it is. What about its composition? Well, colors can give you a hint of what something is made of. But if you really want to know the chemistry, you have to take a spectrum, spread the light out into different wavelengths. And the problem is, again, looking at our chart in the yellow box, once you get to magnitude 22, which is just a few days after discovery, it starts to get really hard to get a spectrum. So we're left with color filters. All right, let's see what we can do with that. So here's um, the results of looking at color filters. So what we're looking at is blue to red in the visible wavelengths, and this is just relative brightness. The dots represent our measurements of Oumuamua. And you can see as we're going from blue to red, it's getting brighter and brighter. On the other hand, all the other curves there, you see one that kind of is blue that looks like an S. That's a rocky type asteroid. It's got that dip in the red due to certain minerals on the surface. Comets kind of follow the red curve that looks just like Oumuamua, comets are red. And we have other things in the solar system that are just kind of flat and gray. This looks like a comet, it's red. But red doesn't mean we've understood what the chemistry is. For example, Mars is red. It's not the same composition as comets. Mars is red because of all the iron in the surface. We have other things in the solar system that are red. This shows some reflectances of a metallic asteroid called Psyche, just pure metal, it's red. Um, Pluto is red because some of the organics. So we know it's red, but we really don't know the composition. And I have to tell you, even at the beginning, we were kind of excited when we first found this. We did discuss well, what if it is something alien. We started to call it Rama for a little while. Um, 
But we eventually went with Oumuamua because we didn't want to be too strange. I did look up the reflectivity of titanium and things that you might make for a spacecraft, and that's also red. All right, so this is what red looks like in the solar system. Let's look here in the bottom row. The leftmost image is a comet visited by a spacecraft. This is Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko, black and white. This is a close up image of that comet. It kind of looks brown. That's what red looks like in the solar system, but the reflectivity of that is 4%, so it's more or less looks black. The right lower hand images, it's the same object, front side, back side. This is Saturn's moon Iapetus. One side is bright, a lot of ice on the surface. The other side is red because it's running into a lot of dust. The top two images, the left one is ground-based, showing what the true color of Oumuamua might look like. And the right-hand one is space telescope image of a Muamua showing no structure whatsoever. And that's why we didn't ask for interrupting space telescope, because we knew it was too small to see any structure. The reason you would use space telescope is to get ultraviolet wavelengths above Earth's atmosphere, or if you can resolve the structure, and we knew we couldn't. All right, so we've got the color now. We don't know composition. What this is, and it'll start off in a minute, Inside the circle is Oumuamua. These are a series of images strung together as a movie. All the stars and galaxies are streaked out because it, the telescope's tracking our object. The, the stripes that come through from time to time are meteors. And you can see Oumuamua is getting brighter and brighter with time. So what's happening is it's rotating. And the sunlight's reflecting from the broad side, the small side, the broad side, the small side. And so, in fact, you can eventually uh, create what's called a light curve, where you see the brightness going up and down. And the brightness changed by a huge amount, almost a factor of 10 to 15. We've never seen anything in the solar system change that much, because at the outset, this would imply the axis ratio is 15 or 10 to 1, which is extraordinary. So once we had this light curve, everyone's trying to say, well, how fast is it spinning? Let's just fold it on top of each other. And when you did that, you get that mess on the right. It wasn't working. What's going on? Well, it turns out this thing is wobbling like a top. So in fact, it's rotating around its primary axis like this. It's also nodding up and down, and it's rotating this way. How does that happen to something? Well, we see this all the time with comets, because comets often have jets of material coming off, and that acts like a rocket thruster. This is an image, again, of that um, comet, Churyumov Gerasimenko, that the Europeans visited. Sometimes you don't actually see the solid body, but you can see the effect, like a sprinkler on your lawn shooting out a jet and rotating. So we can see it in the dust. So this thing apparently is wobbling, but remember, we didn't see any dust, so what's causing the wobble? It could be that when it was ejected from its home planet system, that it got so close to a giant planet that it gave it a kick and it just created the initial wobble. We will never know, but it's wobbling. All right, let's get to its strange shape. We were saying initially 10 to one. We've never seen anything more than three to one ratio in the solar system. Well, there's some issues because we weren't looking at it face on in the sunlight, we're looking at it edge on. And if all you see is the sunlit portion, it may look longer and narrower than it really is. So maybe it's only five to one, but that's still pretty bizarre for the solar system. And if it's wobbling, you can't even map it out that accurately. So one artist said, well, maybe it's kind of flattened disk, but elongated. We don't know, and we will never know because we've got all the data we're ever going to get. But this is the single biggest, in my opinion, scientific mystery that's remaining. We don't know how to form something this elongated. Some people said, well, maybe as it's passing through dust, it just got severely eroded and that gives you this pencil-like shape. Maybe there was an explosion like in the upper right, a supernova, and it just sort of blew off some of the material. There were about 20 or 30 papers with exotic ideas of how to make this shape. And we don't know. You know, that they're still coming out. And this is 2023. People are still writing papers. All right. You know, remember I said HST, we wouldn't use Hubble for resolution. Why did we use Hubble? Why did we need it? 
Well, we decided that we wanted to follow its path as far as we possibly could to go as faint as possible because we want to get the best track to find out where it came from. So that was our which way home proposal. So people on our team measured the positions very carefully, calculated the orbit, subtracted that from the data. And then this chart, the graph shows the residuals. If we had the right orbit, the leftover bits should be absolutely flat. Well, that's not very flat. There's actually an undulation in there. So pure gravity doesn't work. So in the end, what it turns out is we had to add a factor. We had to add an acceleration. This thing is accelerating out of our solar system. Now that fits. You subtract the orbit, looks perfect. So now we have a good path that we can trace home. And I'll come back to this in a minute. All right, this is great. We have a path. How are we going to know which is the closest star? Or how close do we have to get to a star? Well, our solar system has the architecture of planets. And then outside the planets is a region called the Kuiper Belt, which is leftover debris. And much farther out is depicted in this sort of hazy cloud is what we call the Oort Cloud. And its radius is about 100,000 times the Earth's sun distance. And it's full of icy leftovers. So a reasonable distance, a, pass, a close passage to a home star might be the radius of that star's Oort Cloud, assuming they all have one. And in astronomers' units, that's about half a parsec. So we want to find a star where Oumuamua's path passes that close. Additionally, we want it to go fairly slowly, because when giant planets kick something out of the solar system, there's a limit to how much energy they can give it. So we want it less than about 10 kilometers per second. So if you actually look at this table, none of the distances are less than half a parsec. One is kind of close at 0.6. None of the encounter velocities are less than 10, and the one that's closest to 10 is the worst in terms of distance, and then you want these to be relatively recent. So we had some candidates, but none of these make a good home system. And in fact, this experiment is probably impossible to do, if you think about it. And this will be an animation. I'll just start it because it'll probably be a little bit slow. What this is, there was a telescope in space called Gaia that had been surveying the sky for several years. And what it was doing is measuring very precise positions of all the stars. And this is a map showing the movie of the paths of all of the stars. So over time, we are moving relative to everything else. So we don't just need to know our path, we need to know the path of all of the stars very accurately to estimate which one did we pass when. And you can see it's kind of a tangled mess. And the farther back in time you go, tiny little errors make a big difference. So we think we will probably never be able to do this experiment because we will never know the positions accurately enough, even though we know Oumuamua is pretty good. What about this acceleration? What's causing it? We said it was an asteroid. It doesn't look like a comet. What can cause acceleration? Well, there's a whole list of things here. I won't go through them in excruciating detail. But there's a number of physical processes that can create an acceleration. One is outgassing. Gases are coming off the surface unevenly. It's acting like a rocket. It's pushing it forwards. And that's the right direction at about the right rate. So that makes sense. But we didn't see any gas. We didn't see any dust. However, we didn't actually have a good experiment for gas. All of these others, the second one, radiation pressure, it's the right direction. But that is physically implausible. You know, it's like sunlight pushing on a sail. The density of this thing would have to be less than styrofoam, which is not physical. All of the others are valid physical processes, but they're either in the wrong direction, it would be a deceleration, not acceleration, or um, it would require conditions that just weren't met with our object. So in the end, the only thing that's left is it probably was a comet. And then the big question is, well, where was the dust? And you said there's absolutely no dust. Could there be gas, but no dust? And in fact, nobody had a very sensitive um, experiment to look for the, uh, the gas, except for the Spitzer Infrared Telescope. But it had to wait way late because it couldn't point close to the sun. And by the time it got there, 
This is the actual image from Spitzer in the upper right. The colorful bar is the error that we estimated on the position. And they saw nothing, but they got an upper limit, which is really consistent. There could have been gas, but there was an upper limit, no detection. So in the end, we assume it was outgassing like a comet. And in fact, there's plenty of things we see in the solar system that are small, just like Oumuamua, that have no dust. So these are three asteroids that have recently been visited by spacecraft. You may have heard about it in the news. Um, the Hayabusa 2 mission just visited Ryugu, a very small asteroid that brought back some of the surface materials. Um, the US has a mission to the asteroid Bennu. It's visited there and it's bringing back its sample in September. And then you may have just read about the DART mission and it went to um, an asteroid that has a little moon, Dimorphos, and it intentionally hit it to see if you could nudge it in its orbit as a means of planetary defense. And if you notice, all three of these do not have dust on their surface. Probably small guys, when things hit them, the dust settles beneath the rocks. Or in the case of Oumuamua, if it's going through a cloud of material, maybe the dust gets abraded off. So I'm not too upset about no dust. So why was this so exciting? Well, we actually have a piece of material from another solar system that's really close that we can study. And there's no other way to do that. And unfortunately, we don't know which solar system, but maybe with more and more of these things, we'll get an idea that all the solar systems are similar to ours. And very interestingly, just earlier in the year, um, early in 2017, there was a paper that was written, published, that said, all right, we've had 20 years of surveying. We've never seen one of these things. What are the limits on how many there could be? And that paper made predictions, and they said, the easiest one, the first one that you'll find will be a comet. Of course, the first one we find is an asteroid. And so they go, whoa, that probably means these things are common. So the conclusion was, at any one instant, there's probably one of these in the inner solar system. We may not see it, but there might be one in the inner solar system. It was really exciting for everybody, and it actually made the front page of uh, Hawaii's newspapers, Aloha Oumuamua, too bad it has the heart delay on the same front page, <laughs> but everyone was excited about this. Um, there was a second one discovered two years later. Uh, this one was discovered by an amateur astronomer, and he was doing what the professionals cannot. This is uh, Borisov with his homemade telescopes. He was looking really close to the horizon in twilight, and the big telescopes don't do that. And he found the upper image, that's the discovery image, it actually looks like a comet. It's got a tail, and you can see the two orbits. You can see Oumuamua's orbit came really close to the sun. Borisov never came very close to the sun, and that one we could study for two years in totality. So that one we have a lot of data on, but it's not as intriguing because it looks just like a comet, beautiful comet tail. This is an image in the upper right of Hubble Space Telescope, and it's in the background there's a nice galaxy. You can see in the little images below it, it actually split twice into a couple pieces. It was red, just like Oumuamua. It was small, just like Oumuamua. But unlike Oumuamua, the very first spectra start to see this bright line here, that's emission from cyanide, which is what we usually see from comets. So it looks like a comet, slightly different chemistry, but nevertheless, very different from the first one. But just like Oumuamua, it was an intense period because it was discovered right at the time of a big science meeting again. So I ended up, and a lot of people ended up, trying to go to the science meeting, trying to write proposals at the same time to get telescope time. And so in this intense two-week period, because I was dealing with both of these things, I um, ended up spending about 120 hours a week. And one of my postdocs said, I didn't know there were that many hours in a week. Are those dog hours? <laughs> I think this is really neat because it's a rare opportunity to study something that we will never have a chance to see up close because we're never going to get within our lifetime, certainly, to another star system where we can actually look at the science. We want to see, is the process the same everywhere we go? Are we a little bit different? Is something about the chemistry of our solar system such that it created life? Or is this going to be a process that's the same everywhere? 
The other thing I want to come back to is the issue of planetary protection. Most people have no idea how close this came to Earth. 63 times the Earth-Moon distance. What, and we didn't know about it until after it passed. What if it had hit? We wouldn't have had any warning whatsoever because it came from the direction of the sun. How dangerous would this have been? Well, the relative velocity to Earth when it passed was 60 kilometers a second, so something like 150,000 miles an hour. That would have been a lot of energy. Uh, we don't know its density, but assuming a typical comet density, this would have been like a million times the Hiroshima uh, bomb. It would not have caused a major extinction like the thing that wiped out the dinosaurs, but this would have been a pretty big disaster, and we did not know about it. So for the final bit, I want to switch gears a little bit, talk about what we could do in the future, and then talk at the very end a little bit about ethics. So I'm sure everyone's heard about the 30 meter telescope that we hope to have in Hawaii. What if that had been here? What could we have done? All the science I described for Oumuamua we could have done in one part of a night. It would have been easy with a 30 meter. That's the difference. The mirror size really mm -hmm. matters. There's actually a telescope that's going to be ready and surveying the sky next year. This is in Chile. It's eight meter mirror. They are predicting they will find one of these interstellar objects a year. So we're going to be scrambling to follow all these things up. And there'll be so many discoveries from this. It's going to be very interesting times. What about a mission? Some people said, well, clearly you just need to go to the thing and look at it up close. Um, unfortunately, NASA doesn't design missions this way. We're not reactive. You know, you plan a mission, you launch it in six or seven years, you get there in 10 years. What would we have to do for these unusual things to actually have a mission? Well, there's a lot of things to consider. First of all, unlike the things we usually go to, which are in the plane of the solar system, these things come from any direction, and it takes a lot more energy to get to them. And so these are harder missions. These things are coming in really fast. If there's any debris around them, you've got to be really careful because even a tiny centimeter sized thing at 60 kilometers per second is going to do some damage to your spacecraft. So those are some of the issues. And then, of course, um, what you really want is to come up to it, orbit it, study it carefully. I think there's no chance we're going to ever get anything but a fast flyby. And what this chart is showing is spacecraft energy. So this is think of dollar signs. That's how much energy you have to give the spacecraft to get there. On the y-axis is the encounter speed. Ideally, you want zero, because that's a rendezvous. And this is the probability that you can get to these things that are discovered and you have only half a year. And the deep blue is zero probability. Up at the yellow end of the curve, 55% probability. If you spend a lot of money, have a huge energetic rocket, but you're going to have a super fast flyby. So unfortunately, there's physics that we have to obey. What do you do about it? Well, instead of having a nice rendezvous, maybe have a spacecraft that has lots of little subspacecraft on it. You release everybody, and everybody has their own task. As you fly by, the small like CubeSats, six-inch uh, square uh, units, can get up close. If it's hazardous, well, it's only a CubeSat. So maybe you can get all your science with an architecture like this. And the Europeans are actually testing out this architecture. There's a mission that's been uh, funded. It's being built. It's called Comet Interceptor. It's going to launch in about 28 or 29. It's going to park itself. Here's Earth. It's going to park itself in a stable point and wait for a suitable target to come by. They're hoping for an interstellar object. I think the chances are zero uh, because it has to come by at a particular place. It has to come through the plane of the solar system. But this will be a test. Can you launch it, build it, and wait? So this is going to be a neat mission. So let's get into the ethics, back to the causes of acceleration. If you remember, I said it has to be outgassing. Radiation pressure is not physical. Well, we had a scientist at Harvard, Avi Loeb, chair of the um, astronomy department, National Academy of Science member, who wrote a paper saying it has to be radiation pressure. He didn't cite the other people. It's as if they thought of it first. And at the very end of the paper, therefore, since it physically doesn't make sense, it must be alien spacecraft. 
And so he said, it must be a solar sail. Well, how many of you guys sail? Any, any sailors? Do you rotate your boat in the wind and hope to get someplace? No. Sometimes it does that, though. There's no way you're going to get this nice light curve and do a steady move in one direction. So he was just not being realistic. He was out to get some publicity. And he's written a book, Extraterrestrial. He's got movie offers. He's getting all sorts of money from this. And I think it's because he wants to get funding from rich oligarchs because he's lined up to do the star sh uh, breakthrough star shot to try and send little mini solar sails to another solar system. And as Carl Sagan always said, you know, if you're going to have an extraordinary claim, you're going to need extraordinary proof. And he has no proof. Moreover, Avi is doing exactly what we're telling our students not to do. This piece of observation fits my hypothesis. This one does not. Let's ignore that one. This one does. All right. I'll cobble together the things that seem to fit my elaborate idea and ignore everything else. And that is not the way you do science. Well, he's recently been in the news again this week, unfortunately. Um, there was a fireball, just a really bright meteor that came down in 2014. These are notoriously difficult to track exactly what their orbits were. You see them very uh, briefly, and you don't get very good velocities. He claims that the Department of Defense gave him the exact place to look. He got another rich um, person to fund this. He took a boat to this part of the ocean, dredged the ocean floor, came up with 10 metallic spheres that he claims now are alien spacecraft. And of course, we've known about these sorts of spheres since the 1800s. It's meteorite debris. So, in fact, it's even gotten worse. The uh, Papua New Guinea government that was in their waters is now very upset because they claim he didn't have a proper permit. He's stealing from their oceans because if it really is something special, it should be theirs. And so now it's putting the whole diplomatic treaty in jeopardy of a new Department of Defense a deal with Papua New Guinea because of these antics. Why Harvard doesn't stop him, I don't know. Just one final bit on this. Um, these cosmic spherules were actually discovered in the late 1800s with this fabulous scientific expedition that went to the ocean, the Challenger expedition that was studying the deep ocean floor. And they discovered a lot of these metal, metal, metal balls. And what they are, are micrometeorites that come into the atmosphere. Once they reach about 80 kilometers, they melt and form into spheres. And they're all over the place. You get about 40,000 tons of interstellar material or interplanetary material every day. It's coming in all the time. So the fact that, and I actually looked it up this morning, there's 182 scientific papers on this stuff. Avi doesn't seem to pay any attention to it because that's inconvenient. And just a few quotes. These are all from scientists that are specialists in the field. Connecting a specific meteor to a few tiny balls of metal from the ocean is beyond the ability of space command to track. Another one, Matt, uh, Matthew Gagne, meteorite ablation debris has been found, but not from an observed fireball. There never has been a micrometeorite derived from a fireball, and there never will be. And then Peter Brown, who's really one of the top experts, micrometeorites entering the atmosphere at these velocities should be vaporized. <laughs> Avi is weaving this lovely science fiction tale, but unfortunately it's going to teach students and the public, why should you believe scientists? So just a couple last slides at the end for fun, TED talk. Like a true nerd, this is what the TED audience looks like, so those really expensive seats with the blue sofas. And so like a true nerd, I've been plotting since the release of this talk to YouTube, you know, the growth of it, it's up at almost um, 10 million. But here's Viali and Loeb's alien paper, it jumped up. Um, the discovery of the second one didn't seem to catch the world's interest. Um, Avi and Loeb's book being published didn't do anything, and apparently this newest found alien fragments on the seafloor isn't doing anything to the TED views, but maybe after this presentation we'll have a lot more fun <laughs> up, right? Undoubtedly. <laughs> One last fun thing. Um, while I was oh, at the TED so conference, cool. <laughs> a um, 
beer brewery in Vancouver. I didn't know it was in Vancouver. I would have bought some. Um, they made a mua mua milk stout, and on the back it says, forever caressed by the blackest space, the hurling megalith returns, Earthling's prodigal creator in dense velvet wrap disguise, its secret pilot seek adulation, sweet desolation, eternal cold burn, sapiens myths rewritten when reveal the cosmic truth inside. Um, someone brought me a bottle, I've not opened it, um, and I don't know if stout keeps for three or four years, maybe I should drink the thing. So anyway, it's a lot of fun. Um, here we've got a picture of Oumuamua in the young solar system. I just wish the scientists, but some scientists would be more ethical about what they're doing. Um, no wonder people don't believe in science anymore. So thank you. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comments on this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com.